Welcome to episode 53 of Successful Demo, which episode of the Lies, the Theory Cup Bracket Aspects of Warmer Lord You Leave These Cards. Today we'll be looking at the Jinteki faction in Rin and Reverie. And as I mentioned in a uh, previous episode, uh, every faction in Rin and Reverie uh, was only given 8 cards, but the designers managed to shape uh, you know, a very interesting characteristic or feature of each of those factions, shaping them using only eight newly designed cards, which is pretty awesome. For the Jinteki faction, we notice that basically all the cards have to do with uh, advance, uh, ha have some sort of synergy with advanced ambushes and or access force accesses. You know, forcing the runner to access certain cards that they don't want to access that are installed, or making it easier uh, to get advanced ambushes into play. We know that uh, cards like Project Junebug, cards like Cerebro Overwriter, just haven't been seeing much play because they were not there in terms of the power level and I think this is an attempt to push them up. Hopefully they'll be semi-viable? I don't think so. Uh, most of these cards are relatively weak. In fact, so weak that the one card that caught my attention, the one card that I think is interesting, is the one card that has nothing to do with ambushes or uh, Force accesses as, at, at all. Today we are going to be looking at the Jinteki Ice Thimble Larig. <laughs> yeah, of course, of course, yeah. It's pronounced Thimble Rig. So much for being a wannabe netrunner uh, content creator, I can't even get my basic English right. Thimble Rig is a nice piece of Jinteki Code Gate, uh, but uh, even though it seems pretty plain, all it does is end the run. But it is it has bestowed upon us something that we have been yearning for, something that has been missing from this game since the very beginning. A viable way finally to swap our ice. Now I want to make a diversion here uh, and talk about the history of ice swapping cards because there have been many of them printed over the years, but none of them good enough to see competitive play. We start from the very first data, uh, data pack cycle, where we were blessed with Sunset, the card that no one ever played, the card that only looks good on a playmat because bloody hell, that's a very nice looking card art there. But we can see why this card is weak. You can only use it once, so you have to play it at the perfect time, and even then it's only limited to one server. If you put uh, a, an important piece of ice on the wrong server, too bad, it stays on that server, Sunset cannot help you, shift it to a more important server. So it barely saw any play, right? Even with the small card pool back then. So we move on to the next year where On and Profit dropped and we got some Jinteki cards, one of which was Tenma Line. And this was a pretty powerful card. I, at least uh, that's what most people thought at first. Uh, the ability to click to swap two, any two pieces of installed ice. That's pretty wonderful. And I think a couple of decks actually use this to some effect. The problem with Tenma Line is that Besides taking up deck slot, obviously, it is trashable. That's a big problem. Uh, even though it's not cheap to trash, um, you know, uh, the runner can easily deny you this ability to swap your ice simply by running it. It's also click intensive. Another big problem because if you're spending your clicks swapping your ice, that's clicks you're not spending advancing your board state. So Tenma Line pretty much went under the radar from then on until we got Mumbat City Grid. Now this card was the defensive upgrade people were looking for. However, people did not really use it to position their ice in a better way. You know, people weren't using Mumbat City Grid to get Inazumas or Chums to the outermost, as the outermost piece of ice. That's not what people use Mumbat City Grid for. The best use case for Mumbat City Grid ended up being with the on encounter ice, the Kominus, the Grail Ice, making them gain an a ridiculous number of subroutines. That's what people use Mumbat City Grid for. In terms of uh, its role as an ice swapping card, it still has the same limitations as Sunset, namely that it is limited to one server, you can't swap between servers, and like Tenma Line, it's trashable. It's even cheaper to trash here, and it's more expensive to res. So Mumbat City Grid, decent uh, defensive upgrade for in conjunction with taxing ice, not good for swapping ice. Um, so for that, we have to move on to more recent days where we have the Mars cycle and with that we receive an agenda, a 4-2 agenda that allows us to swap our ice when we score it. Again, same problem with Sunset, it is single use and even though this time the restriction on servers has been removed, unfortunately as a, an agenda that you need to score, it is unreliable. 
Of course, the biggest problem with mandatory seat replacement, as I'm sure you all know, is that it competes uh, with... As a 4-2 agenda, it competes with the golden gold standard agendas of Nisei Mark II, corporate sales team. You know, it's very difficult to justify playing mandatory seat replacement over any of those two agendas that typically give you a lot more mileage. So it's not just... It's a weak effect combined with the fact that it's already in a saturated design space uh, left it pretty much unplayed. I have never seen this agenda played with or against myself. Right? So, uh, you know, that's, that's okay. We print another card that helps with swapping in the same cycle. Right? In uh, the Mars cycle, we also got this ice called Metamorph and that's when the designers started the shift towards, you know, what seems to be a more and more, you know, how should I put it? Um, you know, that's when they started realizing what they needed to do to push the effect of ice swapping to the next level. They made it an ice. So right away, you can justify playing these, this card because it's, you know, most typical ice-based decks run like 16 or 17 ice. So it's, uh, it has, it is more likely to make the, make the cut in your 49 card deck as opposed to a 4-2 agenda where you only have maybe 6 slots in your 9 agenda suite for a 4-2 agenda. Metamorph has a good ratio, it's a code gate, uh, costs less to rest than its strength. Even though it only has one subroutine, it's a pretty powerful one and flexible. You can swap any two pieces of ice or any two non-ice cards, so pretty good. The one trouble is, again, it's not reliable. Just like the agenda, you actually need the runner to misplay in order for it to happen. And when it matters the most, somewhere in the mid to late game where you need to rearrange all the ice on your servers, Metamorph won't fire, barring, say, a Marcus Betty trigger. And that's kind of a waste of a Marcus Betty trigger, not to mention a pretty big two-card combo. So yeah, all these cards, all with the right intentions, ice swapping's pretty fun, but all with their respective drawbacks that make them unplayable or not competitive at the very least. And then, enter Thimble Rig. It addresses every single one of those problems that I put in the bullet points. It is able to fire at least once per turn, unlike Sunset, which is single use. It is not limited to one server, unlike Mumbat City Grid, so you can swap ice across servers. It is not normally trashable, it doesn't have a trash can on it. It is clickless, unlike Tenma Line, so you know, you're not losing efficiency, you're just spending the one click to install Thimble Ring. And finally, unlike the Mars Cycle cards in uh, Seed Replacement, in Metamorph, this is actually reliable. It's like Metamorph, except that the effect is printed as an inherent, innate part of the card as opposed to a subroutine. So uh, it triggers when your turn begins or when the runner passes Thimble Rig, both of which are very reliable triggers. Um, all you need is to basically find a way to res Thimble Rig, which should be happening because the runner is running. And guess what? Your Thimble Rig is live and now you can swap seeds all around all day, every day, clicklessly. And that's really awesome. Right? To top things off, you know, uh, this wouldn't be a good card if it weren't a good piece of ice outside of the swapping effect. But it actually is a very good code gate. In fact, it is the best uh, binary code gate that exists right now. We, we remember pre-rotation, there were two cards, one called Quandry and one called Nyx Bronze. Both were very reliable, cheap end run code gates, but they, have seen, they are since gone. Uh, now we no longer have the cheap one to rest Quandry, nor do we have the Nyx Bronze that scales with strength. Instead, all we have is Enigma, which is pretty expensive at three to rest. Thimble Rig fills that gap, fills that niche, and basically replaces Enigma in a lot of scenarios because you trade one subroutine, the loser click subroutine, for this swapping effect, which is very valuable. So because, I mean, it's already, the swapping effect, as good as it is, is one part of the ice. The other thing is that it's cheaper than Enigma. If you're looking for an end run code gate that is cheap, this is your go-to, right? Thimble Rig is the best there is out there, now that Nyx Bronze and Quandry no longer occupy that design space. So, some of you might be asking, uh, I'm overlooking a very important drawback of Thimble Rig, and that is that unlike all the other ice swapping cards I mentioned before, Thimble Rig can only be swapped with another ice. You cannot swap two other pieces of ice um, on the board. So yeah, it is true, that is a downside, however, Thimble Rig is a very flexible card and very skill intensive. There are so many ways you can get Thimble Rig um, to produce the ice swapping effect that you want. All you need is a bit of creativity and imagination. Let's do a demonstration here. 
we are playing an Agon Fusion deck. Uh, we guarded HQ early with Thimble Rig and Surveyor because uh, we, you know, we were facing a lot of HQ pressure. But now we want to score agendas and we want to get our Surveyor onto the scoring remote. In this scenario, you can't swap Surveyor and a remote ice directly, right? Unless there's a Thimble Rig on the remote server, you're not getting a Surveyor there. However, however, if you have a Thimble Rig on any other server, including the HQ server that we have, what we can do is we can do a Thimble Rig swap from HQ to the remote. This places Thimble Rig on the remote, uh, leaving it in a prime position to then later swap the Thimble Rig with the Surveyor. So after two swaps, you get the desired effect. Surveyor is now on the remote and that's exactly what you want. So Thimble Rig can actually allow you to arbitrarily swap ice uh, around the table as and when you see fit. It's just a matter of creativity and time. You need to trigger Thimble Rig enough times in order to make the swap work. But that's not difficult either because Thimble Rig has a very reliable trigger. The worst case scenario is you trigger Thimble Rig once a turn. So after two turns, you get Surveyor in the correct position. That's pretty good, I should say. And there's basically nothing that the runner can do to stop this effect other than to destroy your Thimble Rig. Right, with ice destruction, or maybe swap uh, your ice with inversificator or something. But those are very niche conditions. Generally, you can get the ice in the position you want with Thimble Rig as long as Thimble Rig is rest. So, a very powerful card, very skill intensive, and we'll see just the sheer number of use cases that Thimble Rig uh, provides in this playthrough. We are going to be playing this Ag Infusion Glacier deck. Uh, yeah, I know it seems cheesy to play Surveyor all the time, but it's pretty good. Uh, we are going to spam ice with Ginger City Grid and Surveyor, and Thimble Rig will help us get our Surveyors in the right position. Other than that, it's a very standard Glacier deck, a standard 8 agenda suite. We are trying to chain Nisses, and we have NGO Fronts to bluff, and the rest of the cards are just solid money cards or scarcity to get rid of uh, counter currents like Employee Strike. Now, one. Uh, one interesting deviation is that instead of using Marcus Betty as the typical uh, go-to defensive upgrade, we are going to at um, experiment with the Rumor instead. Uh, another new card from Rain and Reverie. Let's see how this deck performs in the playthrough. So today we are up again. Holy moly, look at that new shiny splash screen. Lovely, lovely, lovely. Thank you so much, Jane at Devs. This is awesome. Uh, yeah, this looks completely badass. Okay, uh, we are going to keep our opening hand for obvious reasons. There's a Rashida there, there's a money card in IPO, and there's a couple of ice. Not the ideal ice for centrals, but don't forget, we are running Thimble Rig. So, ice positioning, not the biggest deal. Right. Uh, my opponent mulligans, the nice splash screen makes that very clear, and we are mandatory draw into hedge fund, like, that's the perfect ca card to draw, isn't it? We're gonna defend HQ because Rashida is prime property here, we don't want it being trashed, same thing with the rumor, we want to keep it in our hand, so even if we let go of R&D, it's fine. But they don't run R&D, instead they set up their clan vengeance, so we know that we have to start acting fast. With the hard and the run provided by Thimble Rig, we immediately drop it on the remote so that they have no chance of getting into our Rashida server, uh, guaranteeing a free Rashida. And we also put Surveyor on the remote because that's where Surveyor belongs. Now you notice that uh, I set myself up perfectly for a Rashida draw. With, I with an ice on HQ, even if I draw lots of agendas, I don't have to worry so much about my opponent running because there's HQ ice. It could be a DNA tracker, it could be a Chiyashi. Uh, I don't draw any agendas, in, in fact, I yeah, uh, all I draw are more money cards and a Chiyashi, which goes straight on R&D. Uh, my opponent doesn't know that's a Chiyashi, because they only saw the top card, but I drew 4 cards with Rashida. Now they install the turning wheel, so it's nice that I have 2 spiky eyes on centrals, so that they can't just farm turning wheel counters freely. At this point, I'm more than happy to score a Nisei, except that I just drew it with 1 click remaining. So I've gotta wait till next turn to... Uh, score the Nisei, but given that my opponent doesn't really have a Black Orchestra out yet, I think it should be safe to score the Nisei. I have to be watchful of the Max Old James, but with two eyes on HQ, I think I can defend this perfectly well. So it's gonna be an install install advance for me, knowing that there's also the rumor in server 1. So if they contest it, I can swap the Nisei back out with the NGO front in my hand, and all will be fine. As expected, my opponent doesn't contest it, and we get our first Nisei going. That's very important for defending my future agendas as my opponent begins setting up their rig. 
Uh, well, scratch that. Who needs to assemble a rig when you can just simply rebirth into Omar? Attack the weaker server, and now, without any ice in my hand, I'm kind of exposed. So, the only thing I can do at this point is to get money by install double advancing the NGO front. I know full well my opponent can get into my remote. They don't have Black Orchestra yet, but they do have Maxwell James access, which means that after this Omar HQ run for free, uh, Maxwell James is now live, they can run the remote, and, well, de-res my Thimble Rig uh, during the encounter, so the end the run won't fire. Uh, so that's exactly what they do here. They break my surveyor the hard way, I'm happy to sap away 8 of their credits, uh, and then they see the Thimble Rig and they're like, Mm, I'm not getting back in again, uh, because if they want to steal the agenda in my remote, they have to make it through twice, uh, having to beat the first Nisei token, and they can't run through twice, they can only run through once with Maxwell James, after which James is expended, they can't run again. So instead they decide to let the end run fire, and spend the remainder of their turn charging up their uh, clan vengeances as they have found their zero. So the clan vengeances are starting to tick up, this is where I need to start actively playing cards from my hand, otherwise they will go into the bin. Uh, that said, this deck is pretty well positioned in the sense that it's not very reliant on operations to be kept in hand. Most cards that I draw end up going on the table one way or another, so clan vengeance not actually a very big deal for this deck. Uh, I can fire a Thimble Rig at the start of my turn here, but I choose not to. Um, I could have also fired it when my opponent passed the Thimble Rig, but given that they have no Black Orchestra, it doesn't make any sense for me to move the Thimble Rig away. I'll keep it on my scoring remote, uh, acting as a hard end to run. Now, Ginger draws me a Thimble Rig, which uh, I don't Ginger install, inst or rather I, I click to draw a Thimble Rig. Instead of installing it on the remote, I put it on archives for obvious reasons. I don't want Omar getting into my servers all day every day. Uh, unfortunately, they respond nicely by installing Omakua, which breaks Thimble Rigs so easily as a zero strength ice. So Thimble Rigs weakness showing right here against Omakua, Thimble Rig is really bad. Against Black Orchestra is amazing, right? Three credits to break a Thimble Rig every time is not a tax you want to pay, but Omakua does, uh, makes easy work of Thimble Rig. Um, I mandatory draw a DNA tracker which goes on my remote, mostly to buff the surveyor. At this point, I'm too poor to rest a DNA tracker, but I do want um, surveyor to at least tax my opponent's David counters. Uh, I continue incubating the NGO front in the remote. I think it's quite obvious by this point that it's not an agenda, so it just stays there, uncontested, as my opponent starts assaulting centrals, starting with archives. Uh, spotting the Thimble Rig on, the re on Archives, my opponent realizes how easy it is to waltz past it, and because they are Valencia, they have the bad pop, Omar runs are still free every turn, that's not good. Uh, well, but on passing the ice, I get to swap the Thimble Rig with something else, hopefully something bigger that can stop my opponent in their tracks. So I'm looking at all my ice uh, that I have installed, there are no good targets. <laughs> There are no good targets at all. I could swap it for something on R&D or HQ, but I, the last thing I want to do is to leave Thimble Rig as the outermost eyes on R&D or HQ because they will just start chalking up turning wheel counters. Never ever let a pure end run ice uh, be the outermost eyes on HQ or R&D unless you want them to go for a big turning wheel dig. You know that's gonna happen. Uh, my opponent fires Clan Vengeance here, dropping a bunch of cards from my hand, leaving a scarcity of resources left. Uh, and this is where I pop the NGO front for money. Mandatory draw. Uh, okay. Do I want to swap the Thimble Rig? I, I, again, I'm looking at my eyes and like, there's, 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 there's nothing I want to swap. I want Shiashi on R&D. I want DNA Tracker on HQ. I could swap the outer DNA Tracker on the remote for the Thimble Rig. Now that I've popped my NGO front, I am actually rich enough to res the DNA Tracker. So that's exactly what we're going to do. Thimble Rig goes on the remote, DNA Tracker on Archive as a bulky piece of ice that just prevents Omar runs altogether. We reveal another DNA Tracker which goes on the remote, again mostly there to buff up Surveyor, but as we just saw with Thimble Rig, it doesn't just buff Surveyor, it cheats the DNA Tracker into play for free so that we can swap that DNA Tracker onto Archive's freely with Thimble Rig later. So yeah, Ginger Grid and Thimble Rig doing lots of work together uh, by you know, clicklessly buffing up my archives with a DNA tracker that I had that was installed somewhere else uh, with Ginger Grid earlier. It's a very nice combination, and now I feel a lot safer knowing that if my opponent runs archives, R&D, or HQ, 
they're in for a nasty treat. They're gonna have to expend all their David counters. Right, I called for my opponent to act on the Clan Vengeance. They didn't, so uh, I just installed advance whatever I drew. I don't remember if it was a Nisei or an NGO front, but I know that uh, they missed it. Uh, it's now in my remote. They missed the opportunity to snipe it with Clan Vengeance. So now my opponent Omar runs, and this is the time to uh, show them the bad news with DNA Tracker. Without a decoder, they are forced to use David Counters here. Uh, and that's the end of Omar runs. That's the last Omar run they're going to get. They run HQ and see scarcity of resources. So they play Employee Strike on the turn before running my remote, so I can't Egg Infusion boop them. And they're going to break through all my cards, all my Thimble Rigs, de -res my Surveyor so they don't have to pay the nasty tax now that they have no David Counters, break both Thimble Rigs, and they're going to steal my Nisei Mark too. Not much I can do about it, I have a Daruma in the remote, but no cards in hand to swap Daruma with because Clan Vengeance sniped them away. So yeah, Clan Vengeance actually doing work against Daruma. Uh, without cards in hand, Daruma doesn't save your agenda, so that's very unfortunate. Here I was thinking of whether I should swap Thimble Rig with something else. There's a Swordsman on my HQ, and a Swordsman is a lot more taxing than Thimble Rig is. Um, Swordsman obviously costing 3 to break with MK Ultra, but only 1 to break Thimble Rig with Omakua. Ha! Surprise! That's not an agenda, that's an NGO front. That run was for nothing. Bamboozled! Um, I did not swap it for the Swordsman. Instead, I swapped Thimble Rig for the Outermost Ice on my remote, which was a DNA Tracker. The main reason for doing this is I wanted DNA Tracker on the inside, unrezzed, unrezzed, so that I can use Ag Infusion's ability to boot my opponent at the base of the server. Thimble Rig allows you to buff up NGO, uh, Ag Infusion's ability by putting unrezzed ice as the innermost ice on the server. You can't normally do this, Normally, you would need to install ice on the outermost position of the server, but with Thimble Rig, you can simply install an unrest ice and then swap it around with Thimble Rig such that it's now the innermost ice. It would be really nice uh, then to tax your opponent with Ag Infusion's ability if not for the fact that I'm employee struck right now. So the move that I just made was completely useless. Great in theory, but completely useless uh, because I can't use the inner ice to boop when I'm under strike. Uh, I did have a scarcity in my hand, but my opponent smartly seeing the scarcity in my HQ fired Clan Vengeance before I got the chance to play the scarcity as counter current. So with two scarcities in the bin, I'm probably going to be under strike for the rest of the game. That doesn't look good for me because Agon Fusion, I lean quite heavily on my ID ability to tax my opponent into running uh, my server multiple times. Right? But we still have a Nisei Mark II counter, and as they always say, when there's a Nisei, there's always a way. So we are going to lean on our Nisei counter to get uh, our agenda scored. Our remote, not as taxing as we would like, but don't forget, there's a surveyor there, and my opponent does not have any David counters anymore. So that's always something we have in our favour, and this is why we run surveyor in Glacier decks. It's one of the very few pieces of ice remaining in the game that doesn't just fall apart to a stim hack. Right? Okay, so our opponent sets up. And uh, now we are given the opportunity to Thimble Rig swap again. Uh, once again, we move the Thimble Rig as far out of the server as possible. Uh, this is, you know, to ke keep our opponent in suspense, right? You want your unrest eyes to be in the inside of the server so uh, they don't know what's coming. They have to invest a lot into breaking the outer Thimble Rigs before they see the nasty stuff that's inside. With no Clan Vengeance. Rem uh, remaining, uh, we can now, you know, um, fairly safely start doing stuff, start doing actual stuff like using Rashida Jahim. Uh, Rashida's actually pretty awful against uh, Clan Vengeance because as soon as you draw three cards with Rashida, they just pop Clan Vengeance and they all go in the bin. Uh, but now without Clan Vengeance on the table, we are all good. Our opponent here runs R&D and expends two turning wheel counters, so I'm forced to counter with a Nisei Mark II usage because they have turntable installed. Uh, I don't want them to swap my Nisei counter away, might as well use the Nisei counter there. It turned out that it didn't matter, my opponent wasn't going to hit an agenda anyway. Oboe Carter was the fourth card down in R&D, so a bit of a waste, but never mind. Uh, we're still under strike. Oh, we're not, we just played a scarcity. So we could boop our opponent into archives here. I'm very, very strongly contemplating it. Nope, we are going to raise the Shiashi. I checked, there are no paper clips in my opponent's bin, and they don't have David installed. So this is a huge tempo loss for my opponent. I misclicked there. 
Uh, my opponent did not break any subroutines on Shiashi even though they had an AI installed, so they don't mill cards from their stack, instead they just take 4 net damage and end the run. They're still alive, but barely. They've, their dirty laundry fizzled, so 5 credits gone down the drain there. Um, yeah, that Shiashi coming into play, I installed it very early on in the game, but now I finally have a chance to bamboozle my opponent with it. No paper clips, get wrecked son. And of course, they can't safely run any other servers anymore because Ag Infusion boop. They uh, get boop into Chiashi, they lose. So we fire the second Rashida. And we see a bunch of agendas. Um, we are not going to install the Chiashi on the remote. I think our surveyor is tanky enough as it is at 12 strength. Instead, we're going to leave all these ice in our hand to pad out our hand because at this point, R&D is thick full of agendas and they're gonna start coming to HQ. We need to have as many non-agenda cards in our hand as possible such that they, uh, my opponent isn't able to run HQ and just win outright. Uh, however, I do get the second surveyor on the remote. Uh, I drew the surveyor of my mandatory draw and you know, having a surveyor on the remote is nice. One surveyor with a huge stack of ice is half as good as two surveyors with a stack of ice. So we have two surveyors on our remote now, along with an unrest DNA tracker and two thimble rigs. I trashed some of my remote ice because I'm pretty poor. I did not want to foot the install costs. Uh, Ginger City Grid doesn't negate all install costs, it only negates the first four credits. So uh, five stack of ice is as high as I'm gonna go without having to pay extra. Uh, my opponent dirty laundries in safely into archives here. Uh, able to break it with Black Orchestra and they're gonna see an agenda. Uh, sniped by Clan Vengeance I think. That's the future perfect. We play the side game, I bid one which prevents my opponent from stealing. Right, so we move on. Uh, we note that there is an Oboe Carter in the remote I think. Uh, so that would be, that's quite interesting. Uh, my opponent's starting to run low of cards as well so pay attention to that. Uh, again, we are not going to install the ice with Ginger here because I'm too poor to install ice. Uh, and the DNA tracker is too expensive to res anyway. I'm now thinking of whether it is safe to double advance the Oboe Carter. I would ideally like to advance the Oboe Carter and have 10 or more credits remaining. That way I can res both surveyors on the remote. If I double advance here, I can only afford to res one surveyor and that's a big problem because a single stim hack or Max or James will get them in. So it really is a question of do I play fast or play slow. I decided to play slow, click for 3 credits and pass the turn over, giving them another opportunity to burn my centrals. And burn they do! They burn my employee, They burn my current with employee strike, they drop the Maxwell James on the table, so it's a lot of bad news for me as I'm forced to defend my HQ, losing even more credits. I'm gonna have to rest the fair child 2 here. It's a nice piece of ice to slow them down and to stop them from farming turtle counters, but not quite good enough. Um, they can still relatively trivially break it, and there's a Philotic in my hand. If they steal it, I'm going to be in a world of hurt. So I can't boop. They access HQ, one card, two cards in fact with turning wheel, but with a 40% chance to hit the Philotic, they missed. Alright, so we draw into another Oboe Carter and I'm like, okay, I'm agenda flooded. There are too many agendas in deck. Um, by this point, I've drawn through 80% of my deck, but I've only seen half my agendas, so R&D is actually full of agendas. Archives has a future perfect in it. You know, agendas are everywhere. This game has gone on far too long, and I'm not scoring enough agendas. This is really bad. As my opponent continues ass assaulting HQ, another 40% chance to hit either the Oboe Carta or the Philotic. Do they hit it? Are they gonna hit either agenda? I think they want to run HQ just for the Maxwell James trigger, so that they can then run my remote. Um, and still the remote Oboe Carter. Here I'm thinking about resing the Swordsman on HQ. That would force them to pay 3 credits with MK Ultra to break it. I'm just looking at my remote ice now. I know that I can only afford to res one Surveyor, but that would immediately get de res with Maxwell James. So instead of spending 5 on a Surveyor that would be de res anyway, I'm going to spend 3 on a Swordsman that forces them to break the Swordsman for 3. Down to 1 credit, my opponent can now challenge my remote with the bad pup and clicking for credit, they can run my remote, break all the thimble rigs and get in. So um, I'm going to... I'm going to swap a thimble rig with Swordsman. So now my remote's more taxing. 
but I can't stop them from stealing this Obokata. They have too much money, and I don't have enough money to res my surveyors. So that agenda is theirs, but this puts them on three hit points. You notice after stealing the Obokata, they can no longer steal any other Obokatas for the rest of the game. They are not on Film Critic, so they can't afford the 4 net damage cost of stealing the other two Obokatas in play. This means that the highest priority for me now is not to score the Obokata, rather it is to get rid of the agendas that are easy to steal, the Philotic Entanglement. This is why it immediately goes in server 1, and my opponent has to play the guessing game here. Do you think it's a Philotic? If so, you should run. Do you think it's not the Philotic? In which case, you should hammer my centrals and find the Philotic. So it's a very tense game here. Uh, this Philotic can make or break the game. Unfortunately, I'm just not rich enough to defend my remote. I'm one credit short of resing both surveyors on the remote. I need both surveyors, otherwise, um, my if only one surveyor is active, my opponent can just de-res that one with Maxwell James. So I'm really hoping they don't see that line of play. The perfect line of play will be to run HQ, activate Maxwell James, and then run the remote, de-resing any surveyors that I res. If they steal the Philotic this way, it'll be very hard for me to climb out uh, to win this game. Unfortunately for me, I forgot to consider the fact that my opponent was a top 4 finisher at the Euros 2018 Championship. Obviously, they were gonna know the right line of play. They ran HQ. They are gonna trigger Maxwell James. And at this point, with Thimble Ring on HQ, I need all the tags I can get on my remote, all the res I can get on my remote. So Thimble Ring moves to my remote server. Um, so that's an extra credit that my opponent has to pay if they want to get through server 1. Thimble Ring, of course, activates when you pass uh, Thimble Ring. So I was able to swap the HQ Thimble Ring onto the remote as a last-ditch last defense uh, as my opponent attempts to assault my uh, Philotic in the remote. On the last click, my opponent runs my remote. I forget to rest the surveyor here. Please pardon all these gameplay mistakes. That was uh, not... Uh, I needed to rest the surveyor there. That was, um, you know, a slip of my mind. There was a very important reason why I needed to do that, even though my opponent uh, just instant max or james it. The thing I'm about to do is, after my opponent passes the last Thimble Rig, I swap it inside like a Mumbai City Grid, and they have no money left. They have zero credits. They need one credit to break the Thimble Rig, but they don't have one credit. The Thimble Rig bamboozled them. <laughs> uh, and with the Maxwell James gone, they couldn't de-rest the inner Thimble Rig. This is why I needed to sacrifice my five credits uh, to... Uh, uh, to burn the Maxwell James because I needed them to not have Maxwell James at the end. So they were exactly one credit short of making it through the remote. Thimble Rig coming in big time because by swapping it down and down the, Gintec, the Ginger Grid server, my opponent could not afford to pay the Thimble Rig tax. And I scored a Philotic. That's one net damage. They are down to two hit points. Uh, not that it matters because it hit the I've had worse, which was a dead card anyway. But wow, 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 wow! Um, no one would expect a zero strength code gate to save the day, but save the day it did, right? Now we win the game as soon as we score the Obo Carter. We know our opponent has no way to steal it. I may as well just install it out in the open. Um, but I have to be concerned that my opponent has a couple of outs remaining. There's a future perfect in the bin, and there are still two Niseis unaccounted for. Because they ran HQ with a Nisei in it, I want I needed to boop them to R&D so that they would lose on Chiyashi. Right? They can't break Chiyashi. Uh, but it turns out my opponent was also misplaying. They forgot to play the strike before running. I just scored the Philotic, so that clears employee strike. That's fine, we take it back. Uh, I've been making a lot more misplays than my opponent anyway. Please pardon the misplays, uh, I was pretty tired when I played this game, so a lot of take backs. Um, I'm sorry if you don't like them, but I'd rather have an enter entertaining game where we play our best than to, you know, um, enforce the mistakes strictly and have a less entertaining game as a result, because all we can say is, whoops, I misplayed. Um, so, my opponent runs HQ, misses the 20% hit on the Nisei Mark II in my hand. Um, I wasn't able to boop them because uh, they would they wanted to play the strike before running HQ, which was perfectly fine, and obviously you would do that. So basically, my opponent's now locked out, right? Uh, they can't run R&D. Chiashi is prohibitively expensive. They could Omar run. They have six Omakua counters, and that's why I'm really worried about because they'll just get a free 
Omar run every turn, which means that they can pick between R and D or HQ, and we don't like that. Um, HQ is also relatively free to run. Again, three credits to break the fair chop two, and they do snipe the end uh, the same mark two this time. So we, my opponent is on match point. Either the future perfect in the bin or the last Nisei Mark II in the deck will win them the game. So I need to win this game by scoring the Obokata in the remote before they find the last Nisei. I don't know where it is in my deck. It is one of the last six cards. That's all I know. I could fetch out with a fast track. Doesn't seem like a good idea, uh, but that's something I could do. Uh, but the main thing here is I'm racing against time. So I have two options here. I could select gift to get money which will allow me to score the Oboe Carter in 3 turns time, that's still too slow. Uh, because this turn I'll play Celeb Gift and I'll spend the next 2 turns advancing the Oboe Carter. That's very slow and my opponent could easily win off Omar into R&D. There are only 6 cards left in there and with that many turning wheel counters, they have a very good shot of hitting it. So my only option here actually is to purge virus counters, but not before putting Thimble Rig back on HQ. Again, this is uh, Thimble Rig at, at its best. It's clickless, it's completely free, you don't need to pay money for it. So or you can play it like Blue Sun. You shift your defenses to the server that need them the most. In this case, I don't need remote protection, right? Uh, the Oboe Carter is unstealable regardless. So what I need here is HQ protection. So Thimble Rig goes on HQ, one more credit to pay for my opponent if they want to get into HQ the normal way. And if I purge, this means they can't run archives either. They can't afford to take the net damage from DNA Tracker because they would flatline. So the only possible server they can attack is HQ. Or if they take enough money, maybe they can afford to install Black or Orchestra or Paperclip to get into R&D or archives the hard way. Either way, this should buy me enough time uh, to win on the Oboe Carter. This is a very, very tense game. It's down to the last five cards in R&D. My opponent's down to the last card in their hand. I don't know why it is, but... It could be a game changer. It could be a stim hack that Hail Mary wins them the game. Um, well, it's not. There are three stim hacks in the bin, but you know, I don't know what that last card is. It really could be anything. It could also be the one hit point that tanks damage from a Swordsman or a Fairchild 2 uh, that makes the difference, or a DNA Tracker even. So, a lot of possibilities. My main concern here is to make sure they don't get, have any free way to farm turning wheel counters. So again, making HQ more taxing here by swapping my Thimble Rig on HQ with a more taxing ice in Swordsman. Swordsman is now an ice that they cannot afford to break because they just trash their MK Ultra to fetch out two. Um, so they need to either get it out again and break Swordsman, which costs five credits, or lose their armor core, which basically puts them out of the game. Uh, they can't afford to have armor core trash at this point. So here, I begin the slow climb to advance my Oboe Carter in the remote. After spending 2 clicks playing Celebrity Gift, I'm being very, very cheeky here. I'm only showing 4 of my 5 cards. I show them the first 4 cards, I'm not showing them the Surveyor. I want them to think the last Nisei is in my hand. So, mind games upon mind games here. Maybe my opponent will fall for it, maybe not. But in any case, I'm doing that whether I'm, I have the Nisei in hand or not because I do not need the extra 2 credits from showing the last card. Again, the remote ice is completely irrelevant here. They can't steal the remote Oboe Carter. Um, so, technically, I could actually allow them through this remote. They access the Oboe Carter, they can't steal it. That's fine. The reason I chose to res the Surveyor here is twofold. Firstly, it slaps 2 tags on them, which gives me the option of trashing the turning wheel. Uh, negating the multi access threat. The second reason, more importantly, is that I don't want them to farm or Makua counters on my remote. That remote is bloody easy to break. If I don't rest the surveyor there, it's one credit to break to run it each time because they have one bad pub. Uh, Thimble Rig costs two credits to break. So that is completely unacceptable. Um, so I needed to sacrifice tempo there to rest the surveyor, which puts me down to two credits, which prolongs. Uh, the amount of time I need to score the Oboe Carter. Actually, it doesn't exactly prolong the amount of time it needs to score the Oboe Carter. I can still score the Oboe Carter two turns from now. I have exactly enough credits to do so, as you will soon see. Um, but yeah, uh, we discussed this uh, Surveyor Resing play after the fact, and uh, Tug make a, uh, my opponent Tug make, made a very good point. I did not need to rest the Surveyor at that point at all. If my concern was taxing my opponent uh, on Omakua farming, what I could have done was to easily just 
continuously swap Thimble rigs uh, throughout the server. So, you know, just uh, shift both Thimble rigs to the outermost ice, and if they try to rerun server 1, I would just slowly cascade the Thimble rigs down and down and down through the server, forcing them to repeatedly encounter the same Thimble rig and spend one credit breaking it each time. Because my server is 5 deep, that adds up very quickly, so they would not be able to um, farm the remote easily. That is what I should have done. I should have just made use of the two Thimble, thimble rigs to generate a taxing remote. Uh, by raising the surveyor, I left myself very vulnerable as I realized here that by triple advancing the oboe carter, I leave myself with only one credit in my bank. It becomes trivially easy for them to run archives and steal the future perfect, and we can't have that. So, um, yeah, mistakes were made there. Um, this is why I needed to save the surveyor money. But yeah, this just goes to show how incredibly flexible Thimble Rig is and how well it synergizes with Ginger. Um, you can just have, you know, it's, it's, it's as though you have a Mumbat City Grid on your server without actually playing Mumbat City Grid because your Thimble Rigs act like Mumbat City Grid fodder. It just goes down and down and down through the server and your opponent has to pay for the Thimble Rig tax every time. Um, that could have carried me on the remote. Uh, that's amazing. Thimble Rigs, so many users. Um, I can't even start naming them all, but you saw that I was able to get uh, the most taxing ice onto HQ when it mattered. Uh, when my remote was irrelevant, I was able to upgrade the unrest ice on my HQ into a thimble rig, and then next turn, upgrade the thimble rig into a swordsman, making it not impossible for my opponent to run HQ here, right? As they're contemplating their last move, um, as I'm about to score the winning Oboe Carter. They know that they can't run R&D, they can run HQ, but they only get two accesses. Right now, my opponent is trying to optimize to get four turning wheel counters. That's nearly impossible. Or they could run archives for the future perfect in the bin, but that just prolongs their misery. Uh, it's pretty difficult to steal future perfect with the side game, uh, considering that they are already so poor and that they have to break the DNA tracker subroutines. Right, so yeah, what else did Thimble Rig do this game? Um, I initially installed Thimble Rig on uh, archives, remember? Uh, the first Archives Ice was a Thimble Rig. My opponent Omar ran it and broke it easily with Omakua, but since it was res, I was able to then swap the Thimble Rig with the Remote DNA Tracker, and that Remote DNA Tracker has been carrying me this game. Because if the re if the Archives Ice was an end the run code gate, my opponent would have just ran Archives every single turn to steal the Future Perfect and win the game. With a bulky DNA Tracker on, the remote on Archives, however, they do not have the option to steal the Future Perfect from Archives easily. So that's a very huge deal. Against a Clan Vengeance deck, having the ability to swap in a DNA Tracker on Archives is huge. So every single central server has a big bulky piece of ice that is impossible for my opponent to break efficiently on the outside. Chiashi, DNA Tracker, Fairchild 2. They can't farm turning wheel counters, they can't easily run those servers, and so my opponent's just stuck. With 9 credits in their credit pool, they can only viably make one run. And the, the real question is, which server are they going to attack? I hope my celeb give distraction paid off. Maybe. Uh, if, they ran, if they run HQ, it will be futile, there are no agendas there. If they run R&D and expand the turning wheel counter, there are 4 cards left in R&D. One of those is a Nisei, they have a 50-50 shot of winning the game, stealing it from under the rug. This game is all but mine, <laughs> but that last Nisei could really screw the game for me. Tug is taking a very long time to think about this, and rightfully so. This is a very difficult decision. It's very difficult to be on the other side of the table, not knowing where exactly the winning agenda is. The server 1 agenda could, have, could be the Nisei. Right, you don't know for sure. Uh, my opponent didn't get to access that. They saw the survey on the remote. They might be thinking it's the Nisei I'm trying to get rid of. They don't know where the Nisei is. All they know is that there's a free agenda in Future Perfect in archives that they can't really get to, and that there's a Nisei in one of the four servers. It could even be in archives. You don't know. My opponent here was tunnel vision into getting four turning wheel counters, which means uh, collecting two of them this turn. So what they ended up deciding to do was to break my fetch out to twice and then jack out. With Black Orchestra installed from the bin, uh, they break two subroutines every time and lack the first subroutine fire. The first time, Omaqua gets trashed to fetch out two. The second time, they pay two credits. 
And yeah, that's the problem, isn't it? They can't afford to pay two credits here because then they won't have any money to run um, HQ or R&D for the win, for the Hail Mary win. So yeah, uh, Tug just completely forgot to take account, take this into account. Uh, they were forced to take the brain damage here because they just cannot afford to pay two credits. So by taking brain damage from the Fairchild 2, this means that they are down to zero hit points and they couldn't survive the innermost swordsman on HQ. That was their plan all along to get two turning wheel count, uh, two more turning wheel counters and then run HQ last click. Uh, yeah, so the Philotic Entanglement actually was the game breaker here. If Philotic did not fire, my opponent would have one more hit point. The I've had worse that was sniped by Philotic would still be in their hand. They could afford to take one brain damage from Fairchild 2 and then one net damage from the innermost swordsman. Instead, uh, by, yeah, by letting Fairchild 2 fire here for the brain damage, they're down to zero hit points and yeah, they just can't get through HQ, period. Uh, so they just conceded on the spot there. A bit unfortunate end of an ending, but uh, it turned out that no matter what my opponent did, there was no way they were going to win because as it turns out, as I looked through my 4 card R&D, the Nisei Mark II was actually the very bottom card in my deck. I lucked out severe- yeah, it was a severe case of luck out for me this game because I think at one point I drew into at least 70% of my deck and I only saw what, 2 or 3 agendas out of my 8 agendas. So. Yeah, all the agendas were clumped at the bottom of R&D, which uh, allowed me to go for this very late game uh, scenario where my opponent ran out of cards and I was able to win off the sheer fact that my opponent did not have the hit points to steal any of the two remaining Oboe Carters. As you see in flatline here, uh, and also you notice that my opponent ran HQ multiple times at the correct time with a Philotic in my hand and kept missing it. Uh, Lots of 40% chance, uh, chances at sniping the Philotic in my hand. They kept missing it and yeah, it was just very unlucky for my opponent. They played very well, but they drew the short stick when it came to Axis Luck. What can I say? <laughs> Thimble Rig is one of those rare cards that I get more and more enamored the more I play it. Um, it turns out that eye swapping is a very fun mechanic. It's kind of like Inversificator. When you first look at the card, you go, hmm, pretty decent pretty good but when you play it you start unveiling and discovering all the potential bullshit that you can pull off with ice swapping it's ridiculous so let's see what we did this game because i think thimble rig um you know i i think i did thimble rig justice by showcasing this game you saw that um firstly i was able to adjust uh thimble rig such that it compensates for my uh, suboptimal early draw. I found Swordsman as my first piece of HQ Ice, which is okay against Omakua, but nothing to write home about. So uh, after my opponent ran HQ and saw the Swordsman on HQ, I then quickly swapped it over to the remote where I was trying to jam uh, my early Nisei and trying to get agendas out to increase the taxation power on the remote. And that brings me to my second point. Thimble Rig is, uh, allows you uh, to adjust and reallocate your resources as uh, uh, as and when you see fit. Ultimately, uh, Netrunner is pretty much, very much a uh, resource management game. You are working with a finite number of credits. As you saw this game, I was so poor, I didn't have any money to res those two surveyors on the remote, let alone the Chiashis and DNA trackers that were lying around left, right and center. Instead, I had to make you use of what I had, a rest DNA tracker here, a rest Chiashi there, and make the best out of it. Thimble Rig being so cheap to res and having such a powerful eye swapping effect allows me to redistribu red re redistribute my defenses according to the app and flow of the game. Uh, as you saw moving from stage 2 to stage 3, um, when it became very clear that I no longer needed a scoring remote because uh, my opponent couldn't steal Oboe Carters anyway, I started uh, redistributing my defenses back onto HQ, the Swordsman goes back onto HQ as a 3 credit tax on HQ. So it's awesome that way. Uh, instead of trying to make more money, which is pretty hard considering I'm already playing most of the good economy cards, instead play cards like Thimble Rig that allow you to redistribute your economy onto the right servers and yeah, uh, defend your servers that way. It's so interesting and it's a very unique way to skill test the player. Thimble Rig, as I mentioned, is a very skill testing card. All these lines of play that 
you don't immediately see at first glance. This is my first game playing with Thimble Rig. So actually, no, third game, I think. So no, first game where Thimble Rig actually came into play. Yes. So yeah, there's so many things to discover with it. And as I discovered this game, you can use Thimble Rig as a pseudo Mumbek City grid. Uh, as you see in picture number two, where my opponent was making that key run on my remote, all I needed to do was to swap the Thimble Rig as into the innermost position to force them to encounter it again, and they did not have the credits to break it. That was amazing. Speaking of having credits, uh, I think the introduction of Thimble Rig as a strong end the run quote gate for Jinteki, and being at one influence, definitely splashable in other factions as well, means that uh, you have to reevaluate your decoder, especially if you are of the Anarch faction. Imagine if my opponent did not have Omakua this game. They would just flat out lose. They cannot afford to break Thimble Rig for 3 credits with Black Orchestra every single time. So now Anarch has to adjust. As strong as the faction is, you can't just use the bin breakers alone. You need some other decoder uh, to deal with Thimble Rig because it's pretty darn good at its price point. Right? Uh, normally this is where I hop into the normals and combos section, but this video has gone way over time. Uh, that was a very long, very intensive game against Tug, and I hope you all enjoyed it as much as I did, despite you know, the undeserving outcome. I think Tug completely <laughs> deserved to win that game. I just luck sacked my way to a victory uh, because they just missed the Philotic every single time. Thanks for watching and happy net running. Uh, I'll see you in episode 53B, where hopefully we'll cover more of Thimble Rig. See you then.